Tonight, we are going to embark on a journey. And I am just thrilled to see so many of you here tonight because it tells me right off the bat that you guys are interested in taking this trip, okay? And so with that, before we do anything else, is anybody here and, they're, and you're brand new tonight? You're brand new to Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley, or has everybody been here before? Is anybody new except for Paul? <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. How many of you, be honest now, how many of you are new to Wednesday night? All right, excellent. All right, welcome. Welcome, guys. Welcome. So we're just going to, for the next foreseen future till the Lord comes back, just continue to teach Revelation until, uh, until he does. No. Hey, there you go. We'll just, keep, we'll just keep going through it. Anybody need a Bible tonight? It's going to be important that you have a Bible in your hand and you're able to follow along. One over here, if you don't have one, doesn't matter which version you have. You just need to have one that you will read. That is the best version of the Bible. People say, what's the best Bible? I say a red one. The Bible that you will read is the best red Bible, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you. And Lord, we ask that you would just open up our hearts and our minds to receive all that you have within your word. Lord, we're, we're about to embark on something that is so special, something that is incredibly put together by you, a message to your children for the times such as we're in right now. And so, Lord, we just ask that we would not miss anything, but that we would be attentive to your word, attentive to all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Tonight we begin a journey to the end of time and to the beginning of time. And as I prepared this message, I've got to tell you, I did so with great anticipation, but also with great excitement. And, and, and I've got to tell you, it's been weeks in the, in, in the making, and, and even, even longer. And, and I'm not going to tell you I was in a hurry to get through Ezekiel, but I was kind of in a hurry to get through Ezekiel because I wanted to get here. And although we saw within that, and within especially the last few chapters of Ezekiel, we see the connection that is made to Revelation itself and the things that are going to be revealed here. And so it's important to understand how it all comes together. I'm excited because we're going to explore, we're going to unlock a book that many consider to be difficult. Some consider it to be impossible to understand. There's been those that have said that Revelation is a closed book and it shouldn't even be opened. Now let me tell you what, nothing could be further from the truth. God's Word has been provided to His children in a way that when we rely upon Him, when we rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit, what He has given us will be translated, interpreted, and come alive within our lives and our hearts and be made manifest in our understanding. And while this book has been made difficult throughout the centuries, it has been done so because of mishandling, because of misinterpretation, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek to understand it fully. Now, I'm going to ask something here, and it's not going to make a bit of difference, but I want to know, how many of you in here have been through a study of the book of Revelation? Excellent. That's, that's fabulous, all right? It doesn't matter if you are considered well-learned in it or if you are considered the novice or maybe you've never been introduced to it before. The way that we're going to approach it is going to allow everyone to draw understanding at the point and at the level that you, through the Holy Spirit, are able to receive. But we're going to shoot and seek for clarity. We're also going to approach this Study by allowing the Word of God to speak for itself, not taking away from it or adding anything to it. The approach for our study is going to be the same as we do with all studies. We're going to search the Scriptures. We're not going to hold to any personal interpretation, and we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us and to interpret God's Word to our hearts and to our understanding. You know, we've been told in Scripture that we're to prove all things. That we're supposed to be workmen not ashamed of how it is that we handle the Word of God. That we're to hold fast to all good things. And this will be the standard for this study. One of the reasons that Revelation is such a hard or considered a closed book is because it deals with the end of times and prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled. The Bible contains 66 books written by as many as 40 different authors over a period in excess of 1,500 years. And yet what's most amazing about this book, knowing that 
on our part that it is the Word of God, it still holds up and has held up for centuries to any test that's been put to it. Not only has it held up, but it's more accurate and more relevant today than it has ever been in, I believe, human history. But something has changed about the Bible. Something has changed in the way that people see the Bible and receive it. The enemy has worked tirelessly over the centuries with false narratives and deception to obscure the Word of God and to replace it with a humanistic, ungodly narrative. And people, unfortunately, are quick to embrace these false narratives. And the reason is very simple. We are in the time for that to take place. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 1 through 5, the apostle says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Is that where we're at? Okay. It says to have nothing to do with such people. And as we enter these last days, it is more important in our lifetimes than ever before that the people of God understand the truths of God's Word. We can't lead people to the truth if we don't know it ourselves. And so that's the purpose behind what we're doing. Everything that's been given to us in the Bible's first 65 books has, for the most part, come to pass. And this includes hundreds and hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. The only remaining prophecies yet to be fulfilled are those that are found in the book of Revelation or those that are references to the time that the book relates to. Oh, now we just went through and we saw prophecies that are yet unfulfilled in the book of Ezekiel because they, they mark time with what's going to be revealed in the book of Revelation. So everything up to this point in the other books of the Bible has pretty much so been done. What's left to take place is found in the book of Revelation. These unfulfilled prophecies concern, uh, amongst most things, the rapture of the church, one of my personal favorites. The Great Tribulation, not one of my great favorites, and the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. And the reference to we know all of these are to the end of time. Throughout Scripture, it is consistent. When we talk about the rapture of the church, when we talk about the great tribulation period, we know that this comes at the end of the age, at the end of time, at the end of the world as we know it. Oh, now, there's end-time theories and prophecies all over the place. Hollywood loves disaster and apocalyptic movies, don't they? The end time movies, they love to be able to take and to memorialize those on the screen as if somehow or another they have a grasp of what's really going on. We see images of strange, wild eyed people carrying sandwich boards proclaiming, the end is near. I think there's more of that going to happen the closer we get. The scientific communities project that the earth is going to be destroyed by an ice age after a, a collision from some sort of super rock from outer space or we're going to be swallowed up by global warming or climate change, all bringing about the end of mankind as we know it. All of the, all of the prophets are out there. All of the, the different disciplines are hailing it. Man is in trouble, and there's legitimate considerations on all these different fronts. There is proof that we have not been the best of stewards when it comes to our world's resources. Misuse and greed, very often, poor management have brought harm, some of which is irreversible. Now, I'm not buying into the headlines, and I don't buy the whole climate change thing, because I think just in its name, it undoes itself. Climate changes. If you live in northern Nevada, sometimes four, day, four times in a day, you can experience all kinds of different climate. But we certainly could have been and need to be better stewards of what it is that God has given us. Amen? 
There's no doubt that the world is a dangerous place. There are countries in the world that possess enough nuclear power to destroy the planet several times over. Politically, we're threatened both on the domestic front as well as the world stage. There's wars and there's rumors of wars and there's the increase of, of hostility amongst nations. You know, evolution was supposed to bring about an end of all of that. We were supposed to get better. Don't you know that? We're supposed to evolve and do better, more kinder people. And instead, it seems like more than ever before, there is a tendency for different nations and people groups to come together with one intention, and that is to completely destroy each other. Economically, from a resource position, we should be able to feed the world's population several times over. But instead, the latest numbers from the UN say that some 25,000 people starve to death every single day. It's broken. Something's wrong. Weather, natural disasters, fires, earthquakes, floods, famine, all of the things that we know have been given to us as the signs of the end times are all present with us. So scientifically and militarily and politically and economically and even naturally, we are much closer to the end of the world as we know it than we have ever been in any previous time. The problem that we have, though, is that the world's solution, the secularist solution, is based on preserving the human race. The humanist wants to ward off extinction of mankind and is willing to do whatever it takes to bring that about in their understanding. They do this all without any consideration of the creator of the planet. They're trying to save it without a savior, making their best efforts foolish and coming to no end. But see, there's a different view. There's a biblical worldview, and that's what I hope everyone in this room has and what everyone in this room would seek to have because it's completely different as it pertains to the end of time. Now, we're not looking for it to just get so bad that it's all over. We still need to be good stewards. We still need to be those that are managing well what God has given us. But at the same time, we know that the end of time is the beginning of a whole new existence, a new program. To the Christian, the end of the world means an end to the living in a world that is dominated and under the influence of Satan. And rather, it means the beginning of eternity ruled and governed by Jesus Christ. That's something to look forward to. It means an end to man's attempts to govern outside the influence of God. And guys, it's, it's coming upon us faster and faster as we see all of the different nations that are now without a doubt, turning away from, not embracing at all, that which would bring safety and security. But it does bring us closer to the time of final victory. It brings us closer to the time where everything that we hope and pray for, when the world will be ruled by the Prince of Peace and therefore bring peace when Jesus Christ returns. Amen? Keeping this Christian worldview is going to allow us to understand the context of this book. We're going to look at this book as if it is written to and written for Christians because it is written to and written for Christians. And that's how we're going to look at it. And this is one of the problems that people have when they can't understand it, when it doesn't make sense, when it's, when it's scary and out of sorts and they, and they get it all out of whack is because they're not looking at it based on who the book was written to and for. This book is written for those who call Jesus Christ Lord and look forward to His coming kingdom. And without this perspective, Revelation in itself, this book is scary, it's difficult, and it's impossible to properly interpret and certainly cannot be understood. We're going to approach this book just like we do all of God's Word. We're going to look at the author. We're going to look at the audience. We're going to look at the agenda. And so in doing, we're going to let Scripture say what it says, and we're going to allow it to interpret itself. But there's some basic things that we have to understand before we start. First off, as we said, the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, which means that there are 65 books in front of it. Hold your Bible up if you have it, and you're at the book of Revelation, right? Where are you in your Bible? You're right before the book of Maps. 
All right. I mean, you're, you're right there. You're right. You're right at the end. This is the, the last, which means that everything that is in front of this is tied to this last book. And as we study this and as we look at it, we have to understand that we cannot take Revelation as a standalone text without bringing in and interpreting it through all of God's Word, not just one book. This, again, is a place where people err in relationship to their understanding. As we study, we're going to find that interpreting Revelation will only make sense in light of tying it directly back to the Old Testament. Old Testament prophecy that points to and holds the key to opening our understanding of this book. Much of this book, nearly half of this book, relates and refers to the Old Testament. And here again is where many people err when it comes to their approach because they fail to read it in context of God's entire word and thus misinterpret it and misunderstand it. We also must understand that there's a whole bunch of symbolism in this book. And it's neat stuff. I mean, I mean the, 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 the writer of this, John, has given us this incredible language. I mean, he's given us this incredible symbolism, but it's not meant for us in any way, shape, or form to try to draw conclusions or identify specifically modern-day events or items that would have been unrecognizable to John. And there's a lot of folks that want to do that. There's a lot of folks that want to misinterpret and misuse and modernize the symbology that is in this book and say things like, well, you know those, those flying scorpions with stingers in their tail? You know, those are really Black Hawk helicopters. John just didn't know what they were. How else would he have described them? And I've heard people go through and try to take and relate in a modern way the text in such a way that it takes it out of context. And even though John, yes, uses incredible language and poetic language to communicate to his readers, it doesn't give us a license to take it out of context beyond what the text supports. So if you're listening to some of those folks and as you get interested in this and you start searching stuff out, be careful where you go on the Internet. There's a lot of wackos out there. There's a lot of great teachers. There's a lot of folks that have far superior knowledge have studied this out way beyond what we're going to do here. And if you've got that kind of interest, I encourage you to do so. But check your sources because there's also a lot of goofy stuff that goes on out there. And we're going to do everything we can to avoid crossing over into that so that we don't mishandle the Word of God. Amen? The year is around 96 A.D., and Rome is being ruled by yet another egomaniac, another Caesar, Domitian. And just like his predecessor, Caesar Nero, he demands to be worshipped as a god by his subjects. And the Christians of the day refuse to worship this crazy ruler. And because of their refusal, they are being subjected to now a second round of even more brutal persecution than what happened under Nero. And in this persecution, one that is caught up in it is John. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. John! John, the same author of the gospel that bears his name, the same one that wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, in all five books of the Bible authored by John. And John was the pastor and the overseer of the church in Ephesus, and he was responsible for the oversight of churches also throughout Asia and what we know today to be modern-day Turkey. Domitius, like Nero, saw the threat Christians posed to his rule. And throughout history, we know that committed people of God have always posed a threat to the world systems and the world rulers. It's happening today. And while all other religions of the world were willing to bow down and worship before Caesar, these Christians refused. And not only did they refuse, but they were willing to die for their faith, and that made them extremely dangerous. This kind of persecution, understand, has been going on in other countries throughout the world since this time. In 2021, America is now starting to see the rise of this mindset of a totalitarian mindset of leadership demanding unquestioned loyalty to its rulers or else. 
and it's happening right now. See, we're experiencing a lot of this for the first time in this country, but it's been going on in the world since the time of the early church. John, at this time, is one of the strongest figures of this faith, and he had to be gone after. And after a failed attempt to boil John alive in oil, you see, this was the the way that they decided to take and make an example of him. So they, they put him in a vat of boiling oil, and he didn't die. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking he wanted to. But he didn't. God kept him alive. And from there, he was then banished to the island of Patmos. It was a rocky and seemingly God-forsaken prison island. It was, it, it, was, it was a nothing place. And yet, little did John or Caesar know that it would be on this island of Patmos that God would draw close enough to John for this revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ to be presented to him and that he would become the instrument who would record it and pass it on to a church in Dayton in 2021. God knew. The audience of this book were Christians that were undergoing tremendous persecution at the hands of the Romans. And while they were committed to the Lord, they were also wondering, (laughs) as so do we, why is the Lord allowing this stuff to happen? How many of you have been caught saying why? Stop it. It's all right here. We know why. There's evil in the world, and evil does not relent. But yet at the same time, they needed some relief. And the Lord gives John this revelation to encourage the saints to keep the faith by seeing what is going to come. This revelation brings forth a different side to Jesus Christ. The first time that Jesus came, he came as a suffering servant. He came as the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God, a sacrifice. One who who put himself in the place of being subject, if you will, to the very people that he came to save. But not the next time. As the only prophetic book in the New Testament, Revelation foretells the future of how Jesus will return. And when he does, he's going to come back as the triumphant king of kings and the lord of lords and he's going to establish his reign he's going to come back and he's going to set everything right the early church needed that encouragement so does the church in dayton we need that kind of encouragement in verse three of chapter one there's something i want to draw your attention to and we'll go back to verse one i just want to draw your attention to this that this book carries with it a special blessing that is found in no other book of the Bible. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. This is a special promise to you and me. As we read through this book, as we hear it being taught, It says we're going to receive a special blessing. And the blessing that we receive by reading and by hearing is is common throughout all of God's Word. I mean, let's face it. If you've studied the Bible at all, you know that you are blessed continually by virtue of your efforts to read the Word of God and have the Holy Spirit interpret it to your life. But this is the only book in the Bible that says there is a special blessing just for you. A special blessing. Now, it says that it comes by reading and by hearing, which kind of tells me that it's got extra special special blessing so i'm going to encourage you throughout the course of this study not only to read it ahead of time to come in and to hear it taught but then to continue to read and reread and and even read in advance of what's coming in the next study so that you can get every bit of the blessing that god has for you as promised in his word john through the inspiration of the holy spirit is the author The audience is the persecuted church of the day and all who are Christians today as well. The agenda, oh, it's easy. It's just going to take us a little while to unpack it. We're going to need to plow some ground first. At this time, I would like to have whoever we've assigned to 
give you a handout. And I don't know if we have enough of them, Sandy. <laughs> You've written a bunch more. So whoever's passing those out, go ahead and take and start passing those out amongst yourself. Start them at each end and just get them going out. It's a half-page handout. Come on, get busy. And I've provided this handout. I want you to keep it in your Bible as we go through the study. And it's one of, of many to come. There's going to be handouts and there's going to be things that we're going to, going to provide for you in order for you to be able to take and to kind of keep notes. If you're note takers, great. It's going to help you tremendously. If you're not note takers, great. It's going to help you tremendously. I encourage you to take notes. I encourage you to mark up your Bible. I encourage you to take and, and, and do things that are going to allow you to be able to have a complete understanding. Now, don't just sit and read it. Wait for me. Some of you are already like, oh, okay, what are we doing here? The whole key to the study and understanding of the book of Revelation, listen, up here. is timing. It's timing. In this case, when you hear somebody say, timing is everything, when it comes to the book of Revelation, timing is everything. The Lord has divinely divided this book into different timelines, and listen very carefully. As long as we hold to these divisions, the book will make sense. This book has a flow, and the flow cannot be changed without changing the meaning and thus changing and confusing the interpretation. So now you can look at your handout. And the first thing that you notice is Division 1 comes in Chapter 1, and it's the Lord's person. Division 2 will be Chapters 2 and 3, the Lord's people. Division 3 will be Chapters 4 through 22, which is the Lord's program. Now, in chapter 1 of Revelation, it's the revelation of the glorified Jesus Christ. That's what this book is about. This entire book, listen, is one revelation. And that is the revealing, the uncovering of Jesus Christ. It's not a collection of revelations. Chapter 2 and 3 is the entire scope of of church history from the beginning and to our modern day. When we reach chapter 4, and in 4 and 5, it starts prophecy of future events, the first being the rapture of the church, which we will see clearly presented in Division 3. Chapter 6 through 19 identifies the Great Tribulation period. Chapters 20 is the millennial reign when Jesus Christ returns. And we just studied that at the end of Ezekiel, the millennial reign and what it is and what it means. We'll see it again here. And in chapters 21 and 22 is, is the new heaven and the new earth. And as we study this book, listen, as long as we keep in mind what is given here, we won't go wrong. What is given here, though, is not meant or given to provide a road map to future events so that we can figure out when the end is coming. I know exactly when the end is coming. Are you ready? When God says so. <laughs> Many have tried to use this book in order to make predictions. And again, if you're on one of those sites and you're reading one of these guys and he's telling you that it's going to happen at this point in time, or this means this specifically, and without a doubt, this is what this is, and this is going to take place. And by this date, how many times in our lifetime have we been told that the world was going to end? Yeah, I mean, you know, you know eight, eight reasons why the world's going to end in 88. I mean, that goes back as far as I can remember in, in and then and every seems like every five to seven years, somebody comes out with something else. I mean, it was going to end in, in, in 2020 or, or no, no, in, in, in uh, the year 2000. You remember Yon 2K? <laughs> the last day of 1999, because as soon as the computers rolled over to 2020, they weren't going to be able to handle it. And we were all going to shut down and we were keeping water in our bathtubs and looking at our neighbor's fence, thinking we would tear it down and burn it for firewood. At least that's what I was doing. And, and we were trying to figure out how this was all going to work. I was. We were a little behind the curve. We didn't have a generator and any prepped food, so I was looking at the neighbor's cat. I mean, I was looking at anything. <laughs> I 
Then we had the whole 2012. The Mayan calendar's running out. And people were losing their minds. I'll tell you exactly when the world's going to end. When God says so. Don't ask Jesus. He don't know. He didn't know. Matthew 24, 36. Jesus said, but of the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. When God says so, it'll all come to an end. The agenda of this book, the theme of this book, is not to serve as a predictor of the end. It's not what, that's not what we're going to study. We're not going to study it so we can look at how close we are. Instead, we're going to look at it in order to see the revelation, the revealing, the uncovering of King Jesus Christ. The Christian in John's day, as well as today, needed to be encouraged at the coming of Jesus Christ, at His rule and His reign. And we need to be aware, yes, of the signs of the time, absolutely. We can't stick our head in the sand and look around and not recognize that what's happening outside our door is a progression towards these events. Absolutely. And I believe that it could literally be any time. Nothing has to happen before Jesus Christ calls us out. I like, I like living every day like that. I mean, I like living every day with the understanding that at any moment, when there's something I don't want to do, there's the chance that Jesus will call me out. Come on, Lord, I'm going to give you five more minutes before I cut the grass. Yeah, I'm not the only one that does that too, right? I, I gotta leave that alone. And yes, we need to be aware, but our focus is not to be on the end product. Our focus is supposed to be on the one who's bringing it about and who saved our souls, Jesus Christ. We're to be those who know that Jesus is on the throne and is in complete control. We can be assured that all things are going according to the plan and that Jesus Christ is coming back. And the message would have brought great comfort to those who were hearing it in John's day. And guys, it brings great comfort to believers today. And I believe that that's one of the reasons why it says everyone that reads this, everyone that hears this, is going to be blessed because the blessing comes in knowing that our future is secure and that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that He's reigning and He is coming back. That brings great joy. It also should create a great sense of urgency. We should have a sense of urgency to reach out and to share the life-saving gospel with anyone and everyone that we can before it's too late. So in asking, then why the book of Revelation is considered to be so difficult? Why do some think that it's closed and why are they confused? Well, the answer simply relates back to timing. If you get the book out of time, if you get the book out of order, your message, your interpretation will follow. It will be out of order. It's like trying to put together your kid's swing set. How many guys have done that? Done like that. I mean, I'm talking the major Mondo swing set thing, right? Or a piece of Ikea furniture. <laughs> Start at the last page and work the other direction. You see, that's what a lot of folks have done with the book of Revelation, is they've taken this, this book and they've, and they've gone through and brought more confusion than they have answers. And through this process, there's several different views that have come out over the course of, of the centuries and over the, the studying of this. And I don't want to labor these. I'm not going to tell you these so that you can go investigate them. I'm going to tell you these so that you're aware of them. I want you to be aware in case you ever come across that individual or you are looking for information and all of a sudden you start hearing a particular bent or a particular direction in relationship to where the person is coming from and you can go, oh, I understand what they're saying. This is the view that they have. And the first one that we see is known as the preterist view. The preterist view. The preterist view holds that all prophecy in the Bible concerning the end times has already been fulfilled. Now think about what I just said. The preterist believes that everything that is concerning the end times that is written in the Bible, they believe that all of the events in Revelation have already taken place, and they did so in John's day during 
Caesar Nero, and Caesar Dimension. The purpose of the book for them is, was only to bring about comfort to those who were suffering the persecuted church at that time. And the symbols were meant to obscure the message in such a way that they would understand it, but others would not. And because the preterist interprets these events, in the past tense, the book of Revelation has little or no relevance for today. How sad is that? This interpretation becomes absolutely impossible as we stay true to the order and to the timeline of the prophecies that are given. This view can't hold up because, well, there's still things in the prophecy that have yet to happen. One of my favorite, the rapture hasn't happened yet. The second coming of Jesus Christ hasn't happened yet. And so the preterist view suffers from not only main, not maintaining the divisions of the book, it suffers from being completely invalid because it can't be that Jesus Christ has raptured the church because we're still here. Then it's called the historical interpretation or the hysterical interpretation. And it says that the fulfillment of Revelation is going on continually in the history of the church and even in the current time. It's happening all around us. And again, this approach violates the timeline that is given to us in the book. And while it's true, we can look around and we can see things that are happening here and we can see things that have been prophesied about the end times. I read you an entire list of them and everybody went, yep, that's right where we are. Absolutely. But you can't take and say that these things have already taken place because there's still prophecies that have to be fulfilled. And while history may repeat itself, listen, history cannot repeat what has not yet happened. And as far as I know, Jesus Christ hasn't come back. But that wasn't enough, so they hybrided it. And they went to a historical, spiritual context. And there are those that believe that the two beasts that will be referred to as we study out the text were the ancient imperial Rome and an upcoming Roman imperial rule. And this view of Revelation says that it was designed to encourage Christians at the time, but everything after that is, is, is mostly spiritual in nature. It's just meant to be spiritual lessons for the church today. This interpretation holds that we are living in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ right now. Those who hold this view are referred to as ah millennials. And there's a lot of them out there. Understand, you go searching for this out there, don't. It'll just confuse you. All right? But if you come across it, there's problems with these views. It disregards the purpose of the book and it opens itself to all kinds of, of attempts to marry current events with prophecy that is in the book being able to point to and say again this is this and this is that and this is that and when you see somebody that is involved in that kind of a ministry talking about their prophetic understanding of the end times and they're telling you that things mean specific things based on what are taught or what is given in in revelation be very careful very likely they're coming from this position and the amillennialist has some problems this view creates a roller coaster world of predictions and near misses that are taking the text completely out of its context. And again, the only way for this book to be understood is to keep it in order. So, here's the one you need to listen to the futurist interpretation. The futurist interpretation. This view is held by all who would be considered pre tribbers and premillennials. We're waiting for it. We're still waiting for the return of Christ and His millennial reign. And this interpretation is accepted by most, if not all, evangelical Christians. And it's the one that we accept, and it's the one from which this study will be taught. So you know of now the other ones. I'm not telling you that so that you can go become an expert in them. If anything, stay away from them. As we were warned, 
when we see these things coming in the end times and people are doing all of these things that are not of Christ, Christ told us specifically, from these people, stay away from them and rely upon Him and rely upon His Word. The futurist interpretation sees the book of Revelation as mostly prophetic, and it follows the interpretations and conforms to the divine timeline. All right. We're not going to get there tonight because it's all the way in verse 19. Most likely we're going to make it all the way to verse 3. But turn to verse 19 for a minute in chapter 1. Because here we see this outline clearly given and where it is that we will base our understanding for this entire book. John is told to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Now, when we follow this outline, the book of Revelation becomes not only open, it becomes easy to understand. John is told to write the things which you have seen. Again, chapter 1, division 1, unveils the revelation of the resurrected Jesus Christ. The things which are, chapters 2 and 3, where Jesus gives messages to seven churches. And in these messages, we see the chronological flow of church history from the beginning of the early church to present day. And then the things that will take place after this start in chapter 4. And all that is given from that point forward is prophetic and foretells about the future. And here's the key, guys. Listen, listen. This is so important. Look up, look, look up. As long as we never try to put chapter 4 in front of 1 through 3, we got Revelation figured out. As long as you don't change the order, as long as you don't get out of the prophetic timeline and what has been given, everything that we see will be able to understand. Chapters 4 and 5, the church is raptured again. I almost want to just skip right there. All right, Lord, we really don't have to teach through this again, do we? We're going to wind up in a seven-year honeymoon with the Lord, waiting for Him to return. Chapter 6 through 19, we're going to see the tribulation and the great tribulation as God pours out His wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. In chapter 19, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to step foot in Jerusalem in the church is going to be with him, and we're going to see him establish his kingdom. Amen? Chapter 20, the millennial thousand-year period, peace and prosperity. At the end of the millennial reign, we're going to see Satan loosed one last time. He's going to rebel, and all of those that choose to at that point in time that have been born during that millennial period and do not want to accept Jesus as their ruler are going to have a chance to rebel with him for an instant. And then Satan is going to be once and for all cast out for all of eternity. And in chapters 21 and 22, the new heaven and the new earth in which we will forever and ever and ever reign with the Lord Jesus, God the Father, accompanied by His Spirit. So with that, that's the intro. Let's go take a look at things you have seen in verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave Him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. The first thing that we see and should note is that the book of Revelation contains only one revelation. It's not plural. It's not revelations. I sometimes get concerned when I hear people refer to it. Well, in Revelations, it's like, no, 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 take the S off. There's no S. There's no revelations involved in this. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ given to Christ by the Father to be given to John, to be given to the servants. That's what it is. And it's only one revelation, not multiple revelations. I also want you to note that regardless of what it says at the top of your Bible, how many of you have the, the, the King James in front of you? Anybody? What's it say at the top? Does it say something like right? The revelation of St. John the Divine has nothing to do with St. John. This is not his revelation. Nothing is revealing or being uncovered about John. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ being given to the world. 
Next, we see that there's a progression from where this revelation came. It was given to Jesus from the Father so that Jesus could show it to John and to his servants. And John received it so he could record it and deliver it to you and me. That's why he did it. That's why he was there. It also says the things which must shortly take place. Shortly take place. And here's where some go astray, thinking that shortly take place refers to a duration of time. If these things are going to come shortly, then there's those that are saying, why has it taken thousands of years? Why has it been thousands of years since John received this revelation? If this is supposed to happen right now, and this is where some of those preterist views and some of those, those, those historical views lend credence and say, well, see, it was supposed to happen, so it must have happened. It must have been going on. It must have already taken place. And the reality is, is that it hasn't. This first section, even if it did refer to time, even if it did mean a short time, what is a short time to God? A day is like what? A thousand years. How long has it been since he received this? Oh, a couple thousand plus. It's been two days. See, God is timeless. And because God is timeless, there's not any aspect of that but that's not what's being said here the greek translated word for shortly is in tacos in tacos how many motorheads do we have in the room you know what a tachometer is all right it's that thing in your car that that that, that measures the revolutions per minute that the engine is making it's a tachometer it's telling you how quickly the motor is advancing in rpm and how how fast it's it's moving and this is exactly what's being said here The Lord is telling us that when these things start to happen, when the end time starts in process, when the motion starts, it's going to happen quickly. Things are going to move fast, and they're going to increase in speed as it goes on. And guys, I'll tell you what, it's, it's, (laughs) it's hard because the longer we wait on the Lord, the more relevant this stuff becomes in relationship to our understanding. How many of you in any way, shape, or form could have believed that in the short period of one year that we have found ourselves in the place that we are in relationship to our lifestyles and our loss of freedoms. If I'd have told you a year ago, a year and a half ago, that this stuff was going to happen, that we were going to be forced into this and forced into that, and there were going to be mandates and edicts, and there were going to be all of these things coming around. Now now the mandating of certain folks having to, to be put into a situation of receiving medical vaccinations or whatever you want to call it against their will in order to work in order to have a job or being threatened with their employment if i'd have told you a year and a half ago man we this stuff's going to happen you'd have been like right even with the change of administration none of us thought that it was going to get this bad this fast in tacos when it starts happening it's going to happen really fast and when Jesus calls out his church, the things that are going to take place, the things that are going to happen, these Christian values that that at one point in time were the bedrock of this nation and now are being seen as being the enemy of the secular nation are just going to pick up speed. What's happened already has shortly taken place. Amen? Amen. For now, the Lord has chosen, though, that he's going to allow the world to continue. Which means that if he allows it, it's because his desire is that none should perish. He's shown great love and restraint, allowing mankind to continue so that they would come to repentance and be saved. But a day is coming. A time when the patience of God will be no more. And judgment will come across and upon the earth. And when that happens, things are going to move so fast. How long is seven years? I mean, in reality. I mean, right now, we'd be like, man, that's a long time. How many of you can't believe how quickly the last decade has gone by? Yeah, isn't it amazing? The older you get, the faster time goes. I don't know how that works. i got to sleep less, man. <laughs> I can't get as much done. The days are only 20 hours long. And he set the significant, or the, and signified it with his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God 
and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Throughout this entire book and throughout all of John's writings, he was very careful to provide a faithful and accurate witness to everything that he had been given. And here again he says, he says, this is what I personally witnessed. This is what I saw. This is what I was told. This is what, as far as he was concerned, he was willing to testify to, even in, in court if he had to. This is his understanding. And in verse 3, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And as we said earlier, this is the only book of the Bible that carries a very specific and special blessing for those who read, hear, and obey those things which are written. Guys, this is enough reason right there just for us to be very excited about where we're headed. We can see clearly why it is that Satan would want to obscure this book. Why he would want to keep especially Christians from feeling like they want to approach it, that they want to learn it, that they want to read through it, that they can understand it. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled tonight to see the number of people that are here because what that tells me is that you guys have got absolutely no fear in knowing what God has in the future. And you want to know. And I would hope that the translation of that knowledge means that you want to know so that you can take and in turn use that to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with as many as you can based on knowing what's coming. And this is where the blessing comes. I think the fact of the matter is, is that once we start getting into this and understanding exactly how it is that God is going to, going to deal with the future and bring things about, not only do we recognize that Jesus Christ is going to establish order out of disorder, which is something that we all want, that there is going to be a perfect rule and a reign upon the earth. We just want anything that's not insanity. I just want anything that's even close to reasonable. But when Jesus Christ comes back, and you talk about having the opportunity to be blessed by knowing and acknowledging that, instead of seeing people run around like a bunch of chickens with their heads cut off, being afraid of everything that's going on, being afraid to use a car, being afraid to buy a gallon of gas, being afraid because of, of, of the, the, the things that are being promoted that are doing nothing other than to, to, to promote fear, we know the truth. And there's a blessing in that. Amen? Guys, I look forward to these promised blessings. And here's what we'll take away tonight, because this is where we're going to stop for tonight. I know, you could go further. You can go, you just got to read. First off, here's what you need to understand, if you're a note taker. Revelation is not closed. It's not difficult to understand. As long as we honor the outline and the timeline that was divinely given by God. Amen? As long as we keep it in order, we're not going to have a problem. This book contains only one revelation. One revelation. And that's of Jesus Christ, the coming King. And next, get ready to be blessed. Get ready to be blessed. I want you to also be encouraged and encourage one another to continue this process of being here. If there's folks that you know that should have been here that maybe thought about it and didn't come and you see them on Sunday, invite them and come here. We'll figure out how to get everybody to fit. We'll make it work. All right? Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ needs to know this information. The whole world needs to know it, but they can't receive it. They can't accept it because without having an understanding and interpretation by the Holy Spirit, they're not going to get it, but they're only going to get it if we know it. Amen? So be encouraged with that. Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we just ask that you would just continue to open our hearts and minds. Lord, that we would recognize that in this book is contained the revelation of King Jesus. We find him throughout the entire volume of the book. Everywhere from Genesis to this book, we know that everything points to Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Son of God. But Lord, now we're going to see him manifest in a whole new way. A way that we know we've been promised, Lord, but this is the future of mankind. This is the future that lies before us. And Lord, we want to be prepared. We want to know 
what it is. We want the blessing that comes with it, and we want to be able to share that with the world around us. Lord, we are in those treacherous times. In the times that just, just call for there to be such a, an outpouring of your spirit. And Lord, we just ask that there would be an outpouring of your spirit in this community, Lord, that there would be revival in this community, starting with us first. That you would revive us in spirit and in heart, giving us and allowing us this insight to this unveiling, this revelation of your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, that it would impact everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we are as we prepare for your coming. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.